Hello everyone, this is Nicholas McKay with Eclectic Spacewalk, and I'm joined today with director and producer Rob Harper of Journeys to the Edge of Consciousness. Welcome to Eclectic Spacewalk, Rob. Hi, thanks for having me. So, first off, when did you first think about this and wanted to make this documentary film? Um, the idea for Journeys uh, began, it was kind of gestated in 2014. Um, and work proper began on the film January 2015. Okay, so still a long time. Yeah, yeah, five years or thereabouts. So what, what made you originally want to do a film about consciousness, psychedelics, like we don't have to get too far into it, but like tell us your first initial thoughts. Mm. Yeah, well it's, it's very much around, it has been, it was then and it's, it's even more so now. Mm -hmm. um, a topic that just kept coming up in different spaces and different places. Um, and two particularly uh, key moments for me, I think, in the, the starting of this film. Um, someone handed me a book by a guy called Stanislav Grof, um, a Czech psychiatrist who discovered the use of LSD in his psychotherapy with his patients in the 1950s and 60s. Mm -hmm. And he's still around today, I believe. Um, so someone handed me Stan's first book called Realms of the Human Unconscious. And it, it just blew my mind. You know, some of the stuff that he was encountering in these psychotherapy sessions, you know, was just incredible. And it was clear that he was a very conservative guy. He wasn't coming at this from the far edges of anywhere. He was a conservative Freudian psych psychiatrist working in the 1950s. But he was also a scientist and he refused to ignore evidence that made him uncomfortable or went against the paradigms he was mm -hmm. working in at that time. So that was a real key. And I would say the other key was TED talk I watched by Graham Hancock that uh, he got into some trouble with TED about, which I yes, believe was called The War on Consciousness. And that was, origin that was going to be the title of the film originally. Um, but I was so impressed by the way that Graham squeezed so much information and ideas and thoughts into that very short talk. You know, that was just like lighting a match. Mm -hmm. And those two things happened in quite a short space of time and so that was the that was the beginning of journeys that's awesome i mean my my particular psychedelic journeys for that was um reading uh albert hoffman's uh lsd my problem child mm. and that was totally revolutionary for me because again like you said a conservative scientist just doing science and then just blown away by results and so um, it was just very interesting that, th that that's Stanislav Grof and Graham Hancock. That's, that's interesting. Okay. And then so, um, w what do psychedelics have to do with consciousness, though? Um, they've got everything to do with consciousness. What haven't they got to do with consciousness? They are, again, you know, it's not all about Grof, but, but he's a very wise man, and he talks about them as a, a non-specific catalyst of consciousness. He talks about them as a, he sees, saw, sees them as a potential tool for studying consciousness. Um, you know, he, the analogy that I'm sure a lot of people have heard is, he made the analogy between, I think it was, you know, is what the microscope did for biology or the telescope did for astronomy. Mm -hmm. uh, astrology, which one? Astronomy. Astronomy, thank you. I just get the two confused. <laughs> um, Quite all right. <laughs> um, so those, so him and Hoffman and so many other people, um, you know, point out, and there was so much interesting research done in the 50s and 60s here in the UK and in the States and in Czechoslovakia um, around these substances and what potentials they have, what they might be able to reveal to us about um, who we are and what we're about and where we're headed. Right. And then so with that, I mean, you, you basically, the, the subtitle of the film, Three Psychedelic Trips That Changed the World, um, you, you, you chose three like heavyweights mm. in this, um, Timothy Leary, Aldous Huxley, and Alan Watts. 
Um, Timothy Leary, obviously being, coming from Harvard, um, kind of renowned as the problem child or troublemaker, et cetera. Aldous Huxley being the British uh, kind of mathematician, right? Was he? Or no, he was an author. Author, that, excuse me. Yeah, um, I think it's someone. And then Alan Watts, the philosopher, who has had more of a Eastern kind of re religion. So why those three? Um, I think it started with about 12. Okay. I think the long list was Can about you tell us, like, maybe uh, who's, I mean, you don't have to give us all 12, but who were some that got cut off? <laughs> I can't, but just in case there's a okay. sequel, I don't want to give away okay. the material. Uh -huh. But um, I, I can say there's, you know, there's quite a few big names that you'd recognize in there. Sure. Well, I mean, I have some names here that I'll, I'll mention. Uh, maybe we'll see if you get a response. <laughs> maybe we'll do it that way. Alex Gray, Anthony Bourdain, Sam Harris, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, Kerry Mullis, uh, Carlos Santana, Steve Jobs. The Beatles, oh, okay. Richard Feynman, that's my favorite. That's what I want to hear about is Richard Feynman, just so you know. That's who's, my who's Richard Feynman? Richard Feynman, he's the, basically the guy, uh, he was like the most famous physicist uh, since Einstein. You know, he basically did quantum uh, electrodynamics and uh, he was like one of the greatest like science educators. But you should look, at, we'll, we'll talk after. Uh, okay. But uh, Bill Gates. And then well, is this a list of people who've taken psychedelics? Oh yeah, oh yeah, right. oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, I got I got plenty. If you need any, and then uh, George Carlin. So there, there's plenty of there. Um, so, but even even already talking about a sequel, that's interesting. <laughs> who knows? But um, <laughs> I, I've been asked a lot about this list, and I I'm assuming so. Yeah. Um, I want to keep them trade secrets for now. But but the point is, um, um, I began reading, and I um, at that point, you know, um, I'm. I was born in West, born in here in the West. My reference points were the Western culture. Sure. And what has the West had to say about psychedelics? So I guess I went back to um, the pioneers. The you know there, there were people that came before Leary, Huxley, and Watts, but they were they were you know some of the big early day pioneers. And I read a lot, and stuff stuck out. Um, as I say, there was maybe 12, and then 12 became 8, and then 8 became 4, and then 4 became 3, and it just sort of, it just sort of happened by various different powers of erosion, luck, chance, and <laughs> whatever else. Sure, sure. I mean, in those three, though, I think you have a, a very good broad swath, at least in the 50s, 60s, because, again, Timothy Leary at Harvard, Aldous Huxley here in the UK, and then... Alan Watts, again, like on the west coast of California, but he had said so much. I think he was like one of the first, you know, Westerners to be allowed to like even practice Buddhism or Zen Buddhism in, in the east. So, I mean, you kind of traverse the world a little bit, even though your focus is on the west. Yeah, well, I mean, Huxley was a Brit, Watts was a Brit, and uh, Michael Hollingshead, who gave Timothy Leary his first LSD trip, was a Brit. So all three stories feature Brits prominently. Okay. So I like to think, you know, we played a quiet but important part in that, that picture. Although Huxley's experience, mescaline experience in the film Doors of Perception actually took place in LA, mm. in Hollywood, mm. where he was living and mm -hmm. working as a screenwriter. Mm -hmm. um, and Watts too was... Was California. California as well. So it was all happening in America, but there was a lot of uh, Brits behind the scenes. Yeah. Kind of Seems like we're in a good spot then in California. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then, what? Uh, just so for for people uh, before they watch the film, it is partly animated. You mm -hmm. have a lot of um, interview experts, so we'll get to that. But so, what? Why did you want to animate it? Obviously, other than Alan Watts and Aldous Huxley not being alive with us anymore. Yeah, and Leary. Oh, um, yeah, right, right, yeah. right. So all three not, not with us anymore. Yeah. Um, I th yeah, I'm trying to go back and sort of tap into that original impulse. Where did it start? Because, I mean, the obvious thing would be, you know, like, record... I mean, you used, uh, uh, I'm assuming, like, transcripts and stuff, but, like, there's plenty of video of these people, yeah. you know, around and stuff. It's It was something about the specifics of those three stories, for instance, like... Um, I think my starting point was Leary, was it was a section from Leary's story, kind of the the peak, like the peak of his experience maybe, or 
the lead up to it when he has that confrontation or that run-in with his daughter mm -hmm. and he's forced to face the kind of shallow superficial way in which he's been conducting himself in the world in his life and with his family um, and the painful realizations that come of it so it actually the film began life as a kind of two three minute animation of just that section with Leary and his daughter and I think there's something about the psychedelic experience that's it's a bit like people telling you their dreams. It's mm. very difficult to grasp hold of and for people to convey to each other and to talk about clearly. And I thought, I picked these authors partly because they wrote about such uh, ephemeral and difficult to grasp subjects so clearly. And then I just, it, it just, animation just seemed like the natural way to visualize them. I, I think it was a great, it, it's definitely an upgrade from like those videos that you could have used because I mean animation it, and storytelling like that, it really can capture more than just reality. You can play with things, you can really do a lot of stuff. So what were kind of the, um, like how, how was that process? I mean actually like making the anime, I'm assuming that was not easy. Um, that. No. So, so talk maybe more about like the technical things of like actually having a partly animate, you know, three things, three stories to put in a film. Yeah. Um, it was a lot of work. I mean, <laughs> a lot of work. Yeah, five I mean, years. did you do it all? I like, didn't. No, yeah. I didn't. It was yeah. done by a really very talented friend of mine, Henry Lamborn. Okay. He single-handedly did all of the animation in the film. Wow. And the guy is incredibly talented. Um, we worked very closely together over a number of years, yeah. um, developing the three stories. First as kind of rough animatics and then in black and white animations and then the and then color came later. Um, it was a really enjoyable process, really, really enjoyable collaboration. And I was very lucky because Henry's so good at what he does. You know, he's like a Hitchcock, I call him Hitchcock, because he, he always put the camera exactly where it needed to be, you know, in terms of making making a world and telling that story visually through camera angles and um, you know we discuss it but so often than not he just had he just placed the camera where it needed to be and and didn't do anything unnecessarily showy or fancy it was um, it was you know we agreed you know to cover it's 40 nearly nearly 45 minutes of animation right it's a lot to do and so we agreed we had to have quite a s kind of sparse minimalist aesthetic but we wanted it to look and feel good as well. Um, and also, we both agreed from the beginning it was really important that we stay away from any the kind of cliched, the visual cliches of psychedelia. We didn't want everything to be tie-dyed and multicolored, and you know, it's very. I think it's very restrained in terms of how it portrays the psychedelic experience, mm -hmm. as opposed to how it could have gone. Oh yeah, you could have ethereal, abstract shapes and d doing all that. Yeah, that's very interesting because honestly, it was it was very clean. But then as well, like even even in the animations, I felt when I was watching it, it wasn't because I mean I like anime as well, and that's a very specific thing. But you you guys didn't go that far. But it wasn't like you said block stuff. Like it was it was a very happy medium that you got in, you got out, told a story. You know, with animation. So. Congrats on that. Um, so then we'll, we'll go to, uh, let's see here. And if I could just add. Like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. For the three animations, we decided to have three different visual styles. So I don't know if, if you'll notice, but people will notice. But each of the three animations has its own visual style, mm -hmm. its own color palette, and its own um, uh, animation style, right. which was really nice and fun to do as well. Right. And then so when, but. After the animation, or I guess not after, but interspersed with the animation is you interviewed experts in the field. And I mean, you interviewed the who's who of experts. And I mean, I'll just kind of talk, Dr. Gabor Mate, you know, like he's, he's known worldly around, Graham Hancock, as you mentioned before, um, Amanda Fielding, the, you know, uh, with um, the Beckley Foundation that I've even, I actually, uh, within their crowdfunded their uh, LSD brain imaging study a couple years ago mm -hmm. I have a poster in my LA apartment because I gave like 50 bucks or something you know so, uh, so she's great uh, Dennis McKenna who obviously is uh, Terrence McKenna's brother 
uh, Rick Doblin who heads up MAPS, and then you have you know psychi psychiatrists, psychologists, ne neuroscientists. So like, how did you begin to? I mean, were those the people that just kind of were at the top of the pyramid, like the the three that you used? Like, how did you start with the the experts, if you will? Yeah, yeah, good good question. Um, I mean, and for starters as well, the format of the film, uh, my decision to, to intersperse animations with live studio interviews, you know, I hadn't really seen that done um, anywhere. And I didn't know it was going to work <laughs> until I did it. It was all pretty kind of, um, you know, for me, pushing the edges. It was, I, it was yeah, it was a gamble. Right. And, it, and it, it, I, I just didn't know how it was going to come together till it came together. Right. And so that was nice, putting together those two worlds. Um, the reason I did it was because I wanted... It was like, it was really important for me that the film isn't just, oh yeah, way back then in the golden era, here are some adventures from the golden era of psychedelics. You know, so how's that relevant to the average 18-year-old or 25-year-old, whatever? watching the film now. So I, I felt it was really important that we dragged these, you know, classic stories into the 21st century Absolutely. and discussed them and said what's relevant about them now, what lessons can we draw from them, what mistakes were they making, you know, what, what, what messes did they make, what can we learn from those, what successes did they have, what can we learn from those. Um, in terms of choosing who, um, yeah, I, I was reading a lot and watching a lot, and yeah, I just went to the people who I thought could give the best, clearest answers, you know, and I was very lucky to have, to have been able to do so. And, and that's great, because, I mean, all of the people as well, it wasn't like a, a showy thing. Each individual one had a specific thing that they were good at, and it, and it tied the story so well. And, I mean, I think you used maybe a couple people more than others, but, I mean, in each individual time, you had them plotted in in a perfect spot. It seemed like, well, I mean, obviously you edited things and stuff like that, but um, how, how did the flow kind of come out of that? Because, I mean, the animation, like you said, the interview, and then you haven't seen it before, like, how did you keep it, keep it fresh? Um, well, you know, the editing process was a long process. It was a long editing process. And, you know, it wasn't, it didn't always flow that smoothly. <laughs> It was a lot of work and a lot of revisions sure. and a lot of uh, good, trusted uh, colleagues and friends giving their very useful feedback, you know, and uh, incredible work by the composer, Bruce Gainsford, mm. who composed original music for the three interview sections. And we worked, you know, a lot on that. Um, yeah, the way I work is with a lot of attention to detail. Sure. You know, which is probably why it took five years, you know, <laughs> everything in the animations, you know, everything in the music, everything in the, in the edit. Um, but no, that was a real dance, a real choreography in itself. Sure. The edit, ed, editing those interview puzzle pieces together and having people flow off each other, bounce off each other, react against each other occasionally. Um, and also just on the kind of, you know, film filmmaking front, it was important to me that, you know, traditionally you might cut away to stuff. You know, you've shot a three hour interview with someone, you'd edit together all the work, you know, all the little bits you like, and then you'd wallpaper it with lots of cutaways of mm -hmm. people in the 60s with flowers, flowers in their hair dancing or whatever, you know. And it was really important to me that we don't do that, that we stay with the space, mm. stay in the interview space. And so I had to select another challenge in all of that was selecting sound bites that, you know, chunks that sustained, that were self-sustaining in and of themselves. You know, I might have a great 30 seconds there and a great two minutes there, but if they, if they, I, couldn't, I couldn't have any cuts, right. if you, you'll notice, like yeah. each clip of a person is a clip of a person. So that, that further added, I further constrained myself. Right, right, right. I was about to say, like, that just made your problems a little bit more. <laughs> So, um, I mean, and, and those, I think that also added a little bit more, uh, I, I was just thinking that that adds a little bit more of a personal human touch to that as well. Rather than just going back to stock footage, et cetera, it's, 
you know, they're right there for the entire time. And you really have to deal with like, okay, well, they're telling me something as a human, if you will. Mm. Um, but so it, going back to making the movie, like the actual process. So you're the director and producer. Mm -hmm. how, tell us, like, I mean, how many other films have you kind of done before this? Like, was this kind of like your breakout? You want to, I want to do this. This is my passion project. Because also, I'm pretty sure you self-funded it, or how, how exactly did all of this come about in the terms of actual logistics? Yeah, so the film was independently funded, mm -hmm. uh, so we had some independent investors. Um, it's a low-budget production. We didn't have masses of money. Uh, I did even put some of my own into. Sure. Um, um, I've been making films for the last 15 plus years in different contexts. Um, I've worked in the television industry here in the UK. Um, this was my first feature. Mm. This was my first feature film. And with the subject matter and with my experience of more traditional uh, mainstream roots of production, I, I knew that, it, that in order to have the editorial, f editorial freedom we needed, and I wanted for this mm. project, this was the way to do it. It had to be done as a kind of, if you like, underground production, you know. And that entails all sorts of its own sacrifices and hard times mm -hmm. and challenges. Mm -hmm. But um, I knew that if I, if I went down the much more straightforward mainstream route and got, you know, big chunks of money to do it, I'd seen the process and been involved in processes in the past where the thing you end up with is so different to the thing you set out to make. Right. They, the two don't resemble each other. And it was important for me that dealing with such a uh, potentially controversial and complex and nuanced subject, you know, it had to be done right. And, and that was my priority. Mm. Yeah. And then, uh, so going back to the, the title, Journeys to the Edge of Consciousness, Three Psychedelic Trips That Changed the World Forever. So um, what I kind of want to ask you, though, is like, how, how has these compounds changed in perceptions, though? Because it seems like, you know, since the 50s and stuff, they were, you know, vilified, etc. And then now we're kind of more moving more into a renaissance, if you will. Um, but you... you, you you specifically use, again, going back to the consciousness, I really want to focus on that because it really is, is it's a question that everyone kind of deals with. You know, consciousness is a, is a thing that, you know, I think therefore I am, you know, the, the entire philosophical question about that. So um, when you break down the title, psychedelics isn't featured prominently, consciousness is. Um, speak to, to kind of how it's a journey, like even, even as a viewer, it is a journey to learn about not just psychedelics, obviously, but again, consciousness, and then you yourself at the end have to kind of deal with that, whatever you just experienced. So maybe like it, you know, the viewer. What what were kind of the the things that you wanted the viewer to go through? Yeah, I'm really glad to hear you said that it, it was a journey for you because that was the intention. I mean, the the title came really early. It was funny like that. Often the, the title is the last thing that pops yeah. after every, everything else. This was kind of almost the first, and it, in this case, and it was, I don't know, maybe it was the 50s and 60s thing, but it, I almost, it was almost like a comic book thing. It was like, journeys to the edge of consciousness. <laughs> like, I like that, I like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of, you know, kind of ye olde Captain America, you know. Sure. And, and I, I think how I, and I, how I first pitched it to people, it was like, how, you know, my, excuse my imprecise history, but however many mm -hmm. hundred years ago, people were hop hopping in wooden galleons and sailing off into the far distance, you know, to discover new lands and uh, risk being boiled alive by cannibals and falling off the edge of, you know, the edge, sure. falling off the edge of the earth. Um, and my, th my thing was, here now in the 20th, 20th and even all the more so the 21st century, we've mapped, we've mapped the planet, mm -hmm. every little bit of it, really. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing more to explore in, on, in a sense, you know, in terms of the basic geography. We know we're not going to sail off the edge of the earth, although apparently some people are still debating that. Yep. But, um, <laughs> um, 
for me, the, the, in the 21st century, the equivalent of that is that inner journey. Is, is, you know, there's, there's a little bit in the intro to the film about inside each of us is a, a vast inner world. You know? And it was, it was that idea, that the, the, the new great journeys of the 20, 20th century, in, in the case of these three stories, were inner journeys mm. rather than outer. Fundamentally, this is not a film about psychedelics. In, right. in so many ways, it is completely. But actually, beyond that, it's not. It's a, it's a film about consciousness. And it's a film, it, it came to me, I think, a week or two ago. I was thinking about the film, and I, this film, because I'm, you know, I'm very, very interested in psychology, psychotherapy, um, mental health, all of these, you know, this is, these are the realms in which I've always made films anyway. And um, so, yeah, so a couple of weeks ago I came to the realisation this, what this film is really about is it, it's a film about the painful process of making contact with yourself mm. in a world where we're not invited to spend very much time mm -mm. in contact with ourselves. And if we're not in contact with ourselves, we, we're not able to be, as Leary discovered, we're not able to be in real, any real contact with the people around us. And as we're discovering as a species right now, we're not able to be in contact with the wider world around us. And when you're not in contact with yourself, when you're not in contact with others, when you're not in contact with planet Earth, um, you know, not such good things happen. Mm -mm. You know, as we're facing, you know, the this big extinction event. You know, so many species are disappearing at this incredible rate, and global warming and everything else we're facing. For me, this isn't a film about navel gazing and looking inwards for the sake of kind of polishing ourselves. You know, in some sort of quest for self optimization perfection it's actually uh, this thing that in order to change the world we actually one of the most effective things we can do is to have a good serious long hard look inside ourselves mm. and uh, however we choose to do that I think what the film's saying is it seems that perhaps if used carefully and responsibly in the right context psychedelics may be an aid that process and then to jump and we'll get back to that but jump I, I know in the in the um, in the title the edge of consciousness yeah I mean that's that's another thing another word that stuck out to me I, I'm not trying to get to each word but it's like the edge of consciousness you're not you're not there I, I don't think anyone is there at consciousness you know yet in a sense of a large scale but at the same time like these things can pro kind of propel you to like right up to the you know to the line and then again it's up to you to to really go over that line, but to get to get you there, these compounds or something that are very important, and at least in my journey, has been very beneficial. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's something that you can speak of in your personal journey, but I mean, how how has that helped you in your kind of um, getting up to the edge of consciousness, but then also making this film? Mm. Yeah, I mean, what I can say on that front is that. Um, you know, there are many, you know, what I've also become aware of, bef you know, before all the more so making this film, is that there are so many different ways of exploring one's consciousness and exploring the edges, you know, because the edges are the uncomfortable places mm -hmm. where we face uncomfortable truths mm -hmm. that often we'd rather not see. And, um, you know, one option, for instance, uh, Holly Harmon, who I interviewed, she's a breath a holotropic breathwork facilitator, yep. which was actually, you know, developed by Stan Groff, who mm -hmm. we were talking about earlier. Um, and um, also, all the more so in the pro since the f five years ago of starting making this film, um, it's become clearer and clearer to me that human beings have been finding ways to alter their consciousness for thousands of years. Oh, you yeah. know, that's very clear. And some of those have involved the ingestion of certain plant substances. Others have involved fasting, dancing, sweat lodges, you know, all, so all sorts of different means and ways of doing that. Um, 
and uh, yeah i i would agree i think you know what what this what the experts what these stories are telling us is that these again used carefully and responsibly may offer us a really valuable opportunity to yeah to look inwards and examine uh, the less comfortable edges of ourselves fantastic and then going back to the interviewing the experts you you kind of asked like kind of one question that was really poignant it's almost like the title you know it kind of just comes what can expanded states of mind teach us about ourselves the world and our place in it I know you just kind of spoke on a lot of that but maybe speak more on not just the the inner battle but then also or not inner battle I don't want to say that but the inner changes but if you if we if each individual person is changing themselves in a profound way that really can have profound differences in in how we live our lives in the world but then also interacting with each other that uh, that I think is is big so like how did you kind of formulate on to that because I know in your research you just mentioned a bunch of things, sweat lodges, yoga, holotropic breath work. I mean, it's not just a psychedelics thing, you know, it's, it's more of a consciousness thing. But then as well, it's, it's not just an inner, it's also an outer and more of a holistic kind of idea. So how did you come up with that kind of, um, I guess you could say, not mantra, but question to yeah. ask? Yeah, yeah that, that came while I was writing it, writing the kind of pitch document, yeah. you know. Um, once the film was finished, it was how do you sum your how do you sum five years' work up in a paragraph, right? And that question came, and it, it I think it was I think it was something that I hoped everyone could relate to. Mm -hmm. It's pretty straightforward, you know. What what can what can these substances teach us about um, about ourselves, the world, and our place in it, you know? And it seems pretty clear that the answer is again, yeah, used carefully and responsibly. I think quite a lot. Right. And then as well, um, so we'll move on to not just the film, but like kind of in the outside world is it seems like the science is backing you up on, on this. Um, Johns Hopkins just opened up a new a psychedelic research center of you know, $17 million, like used specifically, um, you know, PTSD, other health things, uh, bulimia, depression, and anorexia. Um, you know, kind of leading the way with that. And then, as I mentioned earlier, you know, last night, Anderson Cooper, you know, went on 60 Minutes and, you know, kind of sh is trying to show how mushrooms or other, you know, kind of plant-based medicines can, can change that. So it seems like, you know, now psychedelic research has never been more popular, at least in our lifetime. So, you know, what, what do you think of, was that, is that just, was that just inevitable, you know, over the, like, so tell us how these, this has changed over the five years since I want to make this film, and then now we're here five years after I mean, things have drastically changed, at least in that front. I think, I feel like we're riding a wave. I feel like mm. I've been riding a wave. And I feel like that wave picked me up and, and took me with it. You know, I'd mentioned my, my inspirations, you know, one of them being um, Graham Hancock's TED Talk. You know, it's all part of that wave. And it was so nice to interview him, however many, like, three or four years after, after he did that. Um, and tell him that, you know, say, hey, yeah, you know, we're here today doing this because you did that and so everything's a point along the way and I think after these substances were so uh, vilified and banned and mm -hmm. demonized um, you know and, and that's a whole very interesting discussion to be had around why that happened and how that happened and all the rest of it and how to blame characters like Timothy Leary were or weren't, you know, that's, there's a lot of people who have a lot of strong opinions around that. Um, but Rick Doblin had a very interesting quote from, um, I believe it was Richard Nixon's chief of staff, or one of his sen senior advisors. I think his name was Holderman. Mm. Um, have to check that. He was quoted as saying, um, basically, if we can't go after these left-wing hippies, anti-war activists for their ideas, they seem to love these drugs. We'll go after them for the drugs. Um, so, And, you know, I think this whole wider discussion around the war on drugs and how as a society we uh, approach, you know, uh, I, you know, whether lumping what some people would call medicines, these medicines, in with these things we call drugs of abuse, such as cocaine and heroin or whatever else, 
whether that's even helpful is, is a whole other discussion too. But um, where am I going with this? Yeah, um, I mean, I it, just talking about yeah. more like psychedelic research and like just f the five years, how it's changed. I mean, you yeah, said you were kind of, you, you were kind of, <laughs> you were kind of riding the wave, that you're surfing the, the wave. That was the question. I went off on a few couple no, of no, tangents. No, no, but there. all those I think are very important to understand the entire context of that because that's exactly why I was so against you know, it was so taboo in the South. Like, you, you, don't, you don't take those things. Like, that'll make you go crazy, mm -hmm. you know? And then now it's like, that was one of the most transformative things that I've ever done, yeah. you know? Yeah, I mean, that's a, people's, we'll just pick up on that last point, that's most people's biggest fear is, Dennis McKenna talks about that in the film. He says, that people say, I'll, I'm afraid I'll take something and I'll never be the same again. And then what he says is, that's the whole point. <laughs> you know, you will never be the same again. And it's a fine line. These, these, it's, to quote another person in the film, Rick Doblin says, psychedelics are like a knife. You know, they can be used by a surgeon to heal or a criminal to kill. They are not in and of themselves a magic um, panacea that's going to fix the world or fix anyone's problems. But they are this, uh, this microscope, this telescope, that used carefully and responsibly might help people see themselves. And so picking up on that point, what is kind of, I guess, I mean, and you kind of have some skin in this game, is what is kind of your opinion of maybe needed to get over that cultural threshold of acceptance? Is it like more art like this, like more films and more exposure? Is it, you know, the, the science, you know, kind of just pushing this to the edge where people can't really poo-poo it anymore? Or is it kind of this mixture of both that, you know, just going hand in hand? I think it is a mixture of both, and I, I you know, we talk about this wave. As I've been making this film for five years, you know, more and more friends and people I know are aware of what I'm doing. And every time they see an article, I'd get ping an email. You know, Rob, I got it's like ah, oh, Rob. You know, every time that came up, but it started coming up more and more. You know, all these studies around anxiety, around depression, and I think it's people are talking about a. Um, an epidemic of depression and anxiety. You know, uh, we in the modern West, are, as a society, as a culture, are incredibly unhappy and incredibly lost. And one answer has been to just stuff more medication down people's throats. And not to say medication can't be useful in, in, at times, but it's kind of, I think that's reached a critical mass where even people who have tried that are saying, mm -hmm. well, that's not helping. And it's again, it's contact. It's people are so alienated and cut off from themselves, from their neighbours, from their communities, um, from from meaningful work, from having a say in that meaningful work, from a real participation in a meaningful political process. You know, all of these things. It's like, of course, the the, the human response is to feel anxious and depressed. You know, that's called being alive and being human. And what your anxiety and what your depression are telling you is something ain't right here. Something's not right. <laughs> They're kind of screaming at you because <laughs> you're doing your best to ignore it. Um, so I think, I think all of this research, this scientific research, is really important, and it 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 speaks to that you know to that left side of our brain that perhaps, especially in this. Western societies need and want that rational, okay, this is a rational argument. Someone in a white coat's done a study, okay, look again. But I think alongside that, I think, I like to think, yeah, art, like this film and all the other stuff that's around at the moment, plays an important part too because, um, you know, as a filmmaker, what I learned is you can throw all the facts and figures you want at the people. But actually, what really persuades people is is kind of a, an emo to be taken on an emotional journey, and I think what reading those three stories, and sharing them, you know, turning them into animations and sharing them with people is you are taken on an emotional journey, with Leary and his daughter, with Huxley and the flowers, um, with Watts and his trip back into his own conception and back, and and then with the guy at the gas station. Right, 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 right. Um, so with, with that being said, I mean, going back to your point of like the white lab coats, I mean, I'll have to say that that's been one of the biggest things in America, at least, from our kind of like, we need proof, you know, kind of things. And 
I mean, one of the first instances that I saw this in like a mainstream was PTSD with soldiers. I mean, America is about their soldiers and, you know, people like that and going to war and um, America and nationalism, et cetera, et cetera, and American exceptionalism in a way. But then when you have something that can help people that need to be helped and other things aren't working and you have a, these people in white lab coats telling you this will help, it, it really changed the tide, or at least in my perception of five years or so. I mean, that, that, that's a huge deal. But then at the same time, the storytelling aspect is, is, is very key. So, I mean, the fact that you kind of finagled your way around this kind of minefield of like, okay, we'll get, tell a good story, but then also back it up with facts. I mean, that's, that's, that's gotta be a huge undertaking though. It was. <laughs> it was. So what has the response been though? So it's been out for a couple of weeks now. Yeah, we've, we've sort of just passed three weeks. And it's, yeah, it's the response has been great. It, it's out, outstripped my expectations. And hopefully we're just getting started, you know. We're just, hopefully as word begins to spread, um, we're just going to get bigger and bigger. And I'm, I'm getting emails from people all over the world, you know. Uh, Ecuador, Slovakia, LA, parts of the UK, um, parts of Europe. Australia, New Zealand, people saying, "Hey, I want to organise a local screening, you know, and with a, and we want to have a discussion afterwards, and you know, how do how do I do that?" And that's just brilliant. I'm so happy, and I'm hoping. I just want more and more people to do that. Um, you know, we need we are. It's it's, um, it's an independent project. It's an independent film, and it's it's a we need that grassroots engagement from people. So if you you know. To your listeners, if you see the film and you enjoy it, get involved. You know, hire out the local uh, community centre, hire out your local cinema. You know, get your relatives down and um, you know pass a hat round, get some get some bucks in it, and you know enjoy the film. So going back, because I think you just brought up an interesting point that it exceeded your expectations. So let's go back to five years ago when you first emerged. What what was this going to be? Was this going to be like a little? you know, short film that you put on YouTube? Or, I mean, obviously you probably had aspirations of some sort, but like, mm -hmm. what were those initial things that, of, of expectations? Because if you've exceeded them, I mean, all, they, it, it's, it's, a, it's a legit film, a legit documentary film that's out and around the world and everyone's watching it. Like you just said, someone in Ecuador and Slovakia and New Zealand have it. So how, how were, were those expectations to start? And then obviously how it's changed um, in three weeks since it's been released? I've, from the very beginning, I've had the f feeling that this film has been coming through me. Mm. That, you know, I've just been the guy who's dealt with the details. You know, the feeling I've had is this film needed to be made and somehow I got handed the mantle. The and muse took you over. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't always been an easy mantle, you know. It, it, it hasn't been a smooth five years, but it's, I've, I've never lost that sense that, that of being a small part of something much bigger. And I think that's why it's resonating with so many people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it is of the now, it is of the time. And it's, there was something about, someone said to me recently that Michael Pollan, mm -hmm. who's, Changed, you know, who's, who's, Change your mind, he's, author. He, yeah, he's, he's, you know, it was great when he appeared, because I've been, I've been doing this five years and different people have popped up during that five years. And I mm -hmm. think his contribution was important. And I think he bridged, that world of New York Times best-selling author, science author, you know, and, and some of the, you know, I remember seeing him saying, what psychedelics have taught me is that some of these defenses I've developed over a lifetime, I don't need them anymore. He said that was the learning, and I think that hit the mm. nail on the head for psychedelics. But another thing, apparently, he said, I, I haven't heard firsthand, was that we never integrated the 60s. Fully, that this this thing that arose and people didn't know how to deal with it and it you know, push it down, repress it. His he, apparently he said, um, yeah, we never integrated this uprising of energies and ideas and everything else that came with the psychedelic movement in the 60s. And I think somehow maybe the film is a part of that, of integrating a part of our history into this current renaissance because it's. I think, and I think that's important 
that it isn't just a film about now, that it's a film drawing on 60 years ago and looking forward to now. Yeah, and I mean, e even again, like you said, the pushing down of 50 to 60 years, and I mean, it's almost like it speaks to the, um, not just importance of this, uh, say, psychedelics, but again, the broader conscious, uh, broader uh, thing of trying to figure out consciousness in some way that, you know, it was going to come back up inevitably anyway, you know. It, um, but so my, my, I guess my last film question, if you will, is you mentioned that maybe a sequel, maybe not, but like, are you... Have you are you just focused on you know the screenings and such? Have you already started going to the the drawing board because now you're you're jazzed up again or like what what is kind of the future for this or at least for you in the film? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think a little break is probably healthy for me right <laughs> now before I j leap back to the drawing sure. board. Um, and yeah, and yeah, also just being around to nurture and nudge. Um, and make sure that I do everything I can within my power to help the film on its next journey. But it, it's also felt a bit like a child leaving home. Mm. Yeah, I remember the night the night before launch, it was like saying goodbye to, to a kid. You know, it's like it's 18 now, it's off to college. I've done my bit for you. You know, it was like you're gonna go out there and you're gonna meet people and be screen places I'm never gonna go, people I'm never gonna meet, and you know. Good luck to you. Off, you know, fly well. <laughs> that was the feeling I had. That's so interesting because I mean, even after you know, after I publish something, you know, you get that little rush of excitement. But then at the same time, it is that finitude of, well, it's done now. <laughs> you know, there's nothing. We can't go back to those like growing pains or when I was editing and those kind of things. Um, that's interesting. So okay, so last last question, and what, this is about the on, the the, per, the only real personal question. Mm -hmm. But now I'm going to ask basically what you asked the interviewing experts is, you know, what have you learned about yourself and the world and your place in it after making this film? I think one of the, one of the biggest things I've taken from this whole process, this whole journey, has been that there's a lot more to myself and there's a lot more to the world than I had thought, that there's a lot more going on in both than I was aware of, and that I was in, perhaps encouraged to be aware of growing up. And in terms of my place in it, I think uh, my place in it has gotten a lot smaller. Mm. I think that's our challenge. I think, I think we live in a very narcissistic culture um, which is all about power and status and puffing oneself up and, you know, um, like a Huxley saw with the, with the automobiles. Um, I think we live in very narcissistic times and I think uh, a healing a medicine, an antidote to that is uh, a deflate, kind of gently deflating that balloon. Mm. Um, and placing ourselves back in a much smaller part of a much bigger process as a species. You know, sort of, um, sort of giving more respect, recognition, or to the natural, the natural order, the natural world that, that created us. And that we quite arrogantly are kind of using, abusing and destroying at the moment. So I think those have all been lessons for me, and I think those are all lessons that the film and and this whole world can offer, hopefully offer other people too. It's, it's quite a painful journey, but I think it's an important one that we all need to take. Mm. Okay. Do you have any closing thoughts on, not recommendations, of obviously to go see the film, or to, to watch it on Vimeo, um, go out to your community screenings, but any last last words, last thoughts? Yeah, well, thank you for that. The film, yeah, the film's available on, on the film website, www.journeysmovie.com, to, to buy or rent. And I just ask people to support us as much as they can. You know, write a good review if you like it. Um, Organise a local screening. Um, yeah, get involved. 
and also look out for the audiobook project because I've got, you know, I'm sitting on 30, 40 hours of interviews with some incredible people that I had to squeeze down into 45 minutes of half of a film. So in the coming months, I'm planning to release a much, much more extended, I don't know, it could be, you know, when it's not clear yet, but it could be as much as 15 hours of kind of audiobook material from, from incredible stuff from the interviews that just couldn't make the film, couldn't make the cut. So watch out for that. Mm, that's great. So either a, what, an hour and 20 minute film, or it could be as much as a 15 hour audiobook of deep dives. Okay. Okay. Well, I want to thank Rob Harper for coming on Eclectic Spacewalk. Again, director and producer of Journeys to the Edge of Consciousness, Three Psychedelic Trips That Changed the World Forever. Thanks for coming on, Rob. Thanks for having me, Nicholas. It's been a pleasure.